Chapter 5 of Disease and Men A Complete Overview of Every Vaccine Preventable Disease and a Comparison of Disease Risk with Vaccine Risk and How to Make the Vaccine Decision for Yourselves. Peter Tommaso liked talking about vaccines. He could do it all day, and sometimes he did. Since he was one of the only pediatricians in the area who was open-minded and welcoming towards parents who didn't follow the entire CDC schedule, most such patients in the county and beyond ended up at his office. So he was glad to finally have his own solo practice where he could do whatever he wanted, and he decided to start giving a vaccine information lecture once a month in his office waiting room. This was his fifth one, and he was happy to see seven couples from his practice eagerly waiting to learn. Welcome, everyone. We have a lot of information to cover, so let's jump right in and get started. I'm first going to give you an overview of every disease that we vaccinate against, so you'll have a general understanding of the risk that each disease poses and why the vaccine was put on the schedule. I'll also comment on the relative importance or lack thereof, of that vaccine. Hepatitis B is the first vaccine, scheduled to be given on the day of birth, one month, and six months of age. This is mainly a sexually transmitted disease. It can also be passed by sharing IV drug needles or any type of accidental blood exposure. The only realistic way a baby will catch it is if the mom is a chronic Hep B carrier and she passes it to her baby during birth through all the blood exposure in the birth canal. The number of babies who become infected this way is about 30 every year. By the way, all disease statistics we are going to discuss are based only on the United States, not the world. Just FYI. Another 30 or so preschoolers and about 70 elementary age children are diagnosed with Hep B every year as well. These occur either from accidental blood exposure or were acquired at birth but had delayed onset of the disease. Hep B is very severe for babies who catch it during birth. About 25% of such cases are fatal, and most who survive will have lifelong liver problems. It is less severe for toddlers and preschoolers who catch it by accidental blood exposure. They have a 35% chance of chronic disease. Elementary age kids have a 10% risk of chronic disease. For adults, it's a different story. 95% of exposed adults will clear the disease without any lasting effects. The 5% who do become chronic carriers can be treated with strong medications that cure about one-third of these. The remaining victims will have varying degrees of liver disease. It's estimated that about 1% of American adults are chronic hepatitis B carriers, and about 4,000 adults die from this each year. By the way, if a parent has Hep B and is not passed to the baby during birth, then there's about a 35% chance the child will catch it from a parent from accidental blood exposure just from living together over the years of childhood. Bottom line on this disease is that while there are some situations in which this vaccine may be useful for American babies, for the vast majority there is no particular benefit to getting this vaccine during infancy or young childhood. Moving on to disease number two, Hib or Haemophilus influenza type B. This bacteria is transmitted like the common cold. It can cause a wide range of symptoms, from just a mild cough and runny nose, to pneumonia, to bloodstream infections, to a severe throat infection called epiglottitis, to meningitis. Before this vaccine was made available in the late 80s, there were thought to be about 20,000 severe cases of this disease every year. Now it's pretty much eradicated, with only about 10 severe infections being reported nationwide every year. The fatality rate for the most severe form of infection, meningitis, is about 5%. So it's a very bad disease, but thankfully it's extremely rare. The vaccine is scheduled at 2 months, 4 months, 6 months, and 15 months, 
to provide ever-increasing levels of immunity during the early years when this disease poses the greatest risk. Kids older than two years of age rarely catch Hib, although it can technically occur at any age. Parents who wish to delay vaccines can get their toddler just one Hib dose at 15 months or later, and that one dose gives just as much immunity as if you had done all four along the way. This one dose works much better on the more mature immune system. Bottom line, it's a really bad disease, and thank God it's now so rare. Disease number three, pneumococcal disease. This bacteria causes the same conditions as Hib, except it does not cause epiglottitis, and it can be just as mild or just as severe. But when an infant or young child catches a severe case, like meningitis, the fatality rate is higher, about 20%. Like Hib, it's also treatable with antibiotics. But unlike Hib, PC disease is not rare. There are an estimated 2,000 or so cases of severe infections, like meningitis, bloodstream infections, or severe pneumonia, in kids under 5 each year. And there are probably hundreds of thousands of mild cases each year in kids and adults that don't even get diagnosed and just get better with antibiotics or often even without treatment. The vaccine is given on the same four-dose schedule as Hib. Those who don't want vaccines during infancy can just get two doses after age one or one dose after age two and get full immunity. The vaccine helps prevent 13 strains of this disease, but there are almost 100 strains out there, so it's still possible to catch PC even if vaccinated. Bottom line, most cases are mild, but severe cases can happen, and this is not rare. The fourth disease is diphtheria. This disease has been eradicated from the U.S., so there's really no risk for American babies now. But it was a horrible disease way back when. It causes a severe throat infection that makes it difficult to breathe. It's transmitted like a cold. There is treatment available if someone does happen to catch it. The fifth disease is tetanus. You all know what tetanus is. Fortunately, it's rare. Each year in the U.S., there are about one baby or young child diagnosed with tetanus, about five teenagers, and about 50 adults nationwide. About 10% who develop the neurological symptoms of tetanus will die. If you've never had a tetanus shot, and if you get a very serious dirty wound, not just a simple clean cut that needs a few stitches, something really deep and dirty, getting what's called a TIG shot, tetanus immune globulin, which is different than the vaccine, can neutralize tetanus germs so you don't come down with it. Getting the first dose of just the regular vaccine doesn't really help at the time of injury unless you've already had at least one prior vaccine dose. Bottom line on tetanus, it's just not a disease of infancy, and it is so rare in children. It's really bad when it does happen, but the chance of it happening is extremely small, and there is a preventive treatment if your baby or child gets injured but doesn't yet have the vaccine. Plus, thorough wound cleansing virtually eliminates the chance of tetanus, even in a high-risk wound. It's not like every unvaccinated person who gets impaled by a dirty, rusty spike will get tetanus. Disease number six is whooping cough, also known as pertussis. This vaccine is mixed with diphtheria and tetanus vaccines as the DTAP vaccine. It's given at two, four, and six months, then again at 18 months, five years, and 12 years of age. Adults can also get one dose as a booster. You can't get just a plain whooping cough vaccine. It only comes with tetanus and diphtheria. Whooping cough is very severe if a young infant catches it, about 20 infants die each year from this disease, and virtually all of these are three months and younger. It is almost unheard of for an older infant or child to die from this disease. 
About 1 in 200 reported newborn cases are fatal. The germ infects the throat and upper lungs and causes extremely severe coughing spells. It can be treated with antibiotics only if the disease is recognized early and antibiotics are started within several days of the onset of the severe cough. Bottom line on the DTAP vaccine is that honestly, babies don't need tetanus and diphtheria shots, but also honestly, whooping cough is a bad disease to catch in the first few months of life, and it's no fun for older babies and kids with weeks or even a few months of severe coughing fits. But there's little to no risk of dying from it once your baby is about four months and older. This vaccine is offered to pregnant women in order to pass some immunity to a baby through the placenta in hopes that the baby will have some immunity during the first two months of life before he has his own shots. Research has not yet proven that this transplacental immunity works well, so it's just a theoretical benefit. Due to a lack of safety research, I don't recommend any vaccines during pregnancy, by the way. I want to say that there is a lot more that could be said about this vaccine and all the ins and outs of whether or not to get it. This is just a brief introduction to the diseases. We'll spend more on this shot later. Okay, so is your head spinning yet? <laughs> Mine too. To briefly recap, we've discussed hepatitis B, tetanus and diphtheria, which are all very bad diseases but pose little to no risk to babies. And we've talked about Hib and PC meningitis and whooping cough, which do pose some risk to babies. Now let's push on for a bit more and then we'll take a break. Polio. This disease has been eradicated from the United States for over 35 years now. No one has caught the disease in the U.S. in all this time. We still give the shot at 2, 4, 6, and 18 months with a booster at 5 years in order to give people immunity in case we ever have an outbreak. But again, this hasn't happened in over 35 years. We used to give people the oral polio vaccine, which worked much better and makes people pretty much immune to the disease. But about eight American children were being paralyzed every year from this live oral vaccine. So in the late 90s, we switched to the injected vaccine to avoid the paralysis reactions. This injected vaccine, by the way, doesn't make us immune. It only gives us internal immunity in our bloodstream so that the infection can't invade inside and get to the brain. But we would still catch the infection in our intestinal tract if exposed and can pass it along to others. You just won't know you are sick with it because you won't have neurological symptoms. 99% of people who do catch it won't even know it anyway because the infection only causes neurological problems in less than 1% of cases. And that's how it was way back when polio was everywhere. 99% of people who caught it didn't even know they had it. It was the unlucky 1% who suffered nerve damage. Bottom line is that this disease is pretty much zero risk to Americans, and the disease is virtually eradicated worldwide now, except for a few small pockets of disease in Central Asia, like Pakistan and Afghanistan. Okay, now for rotavirus. This is a vomiting diarrhea disease that is virtually harmless to almost everyone who catches it, especially of breastfeeding. The vomiting and diarrhea are certainly no fun, but you get through it. Every baby or child catches this disease by the time they have been in daycare or preschool for a year or two because it spreads easily in those places every winter. Before this vaccine came out in the early 2000s, the U.S. did have about 50 reported fatalities from the dehydration complications of this disease every year. These deaths were mostly in babies who didn't get access to IV fluids in time. This still, sadly, happens to about 10 babies each year. One brand of this oral liquid vaccine is given in just two doses, at two and four months, and it only protects against the one most common strain of the disease. 
The other brand is three doses and protects against four strains. There are more strains out there that the vaccine does not cover. Bottom line on this one is that it's a harmless disease for most babies and toddlers. It's certainly not a fun disease, though. Some will have diarrhea for weeks, and some will need IV fluids, especially if young. But if not in early daycare, then the risk of catching it while young is small. And if you catch the disease as a preschooler, it shouldn't be a big deal. Now for disease number, what is it? Eight? Okay, the flu. This is another complicated disease and vaccine that deserves a longer discussion later, but here are the pertinent disease facts. Of course, most cases are ultimately harmless, even for babies. However, each year in the U.S., there are about 20 deaths from the flu in babies, about 20 in preschoolers and, and toddlers, and about 20 in children and teens, and about 40 deaths in young adults. Then in the elderly and 65 and older, there are about 1,300 deaths reported each year. All of these deaths are tragic, of course, but realize, given the enormity of our population, the risk of dying from the flu is minuscule. The shot is now recommended for every child every year between 6 months and 18 years at the start of each flu season. And the shot is also recommended for pregnant moms. I don't advise it due to the lack of safety research, like with the Tdap. The media has spread the false idea that the flu is extremely dangerous during pregnancy, but the research does not support this. At most, flu may be a tiny bit more risky during pregnancy than for other healthy adults, but this difference is negligible, and in my opinion, not worth vaccinating for during the one time in your life when you are supposed to be the most careful about what goes into your body. So everything we've discussed so far is started within the first six months of life, 24 vaccine doses actually. What's interesting is that we used to give that many vaccine doses throughout all of childhood up through the late 1980s. What we give now grouped into the first six months of life is quite an escalation from the old days. Now on to some of the later shots. MMR vaccine is for measles, mumps, and rubella. This live virus vaccine is given at one and five years of age. The rates of measles infection have varied between 55 cases each year to as many as 600. Children don't die from measles in a modern, healthy nation like ours. The only childhood fatality from measles in recent decades was back in 2003. The fatality rate for measles is about 1 in 10,000 cases, although there is some debate over that that we will discuss later. It's very contagious and easily spread like the common cold. It's certainly no fun to go through, but it's not the deadly disease that the media tries to portray during the small outbreaks that we have. Mumps is another mostly harmless disease. It causes sore throat, fever, and swollen cheeks. It makes you look like a chipmunk for a week or so. We see between 200 and 6,000 cases each year. It's not nearly as contagious as measles, so it doesn't easily spread. Mumps isn't fatal, but very rarely it can cause sterility if an adult catches it. Rubella is the R in MMR vaccine. It's been pretty much eradicated from the US. It's a harmless virus that causes fever and a rash. The reason we vaccinate against it is that if a pregnant mom catches rubella, the virus can cause birth defects. So we've eliminated the disease from our population so that pregnant moms and their babies don't have this risk. Each year, however, there are one or two or three babies born with a rubella-like birth defect. So the risk isn't zero, but it is very, very small. There is no treatment for rubella. Oh yeah, that reminds me, treatment. I told you earlier which diseases can be treated. Knowing that a disease does have a treatment makes you feel a little less helpless. Rotavirus does not have a specific antiviral treatment. The flu does. Mumps and rubella don't, but measles does. 
That may surprise you because you rarely hear the news warning people to go out and get their vitamin A preventive treatment during a measles outbreak. But taking high-dose vitamin A for two days greatly reduces the chances of suffering a severe case of the disease. It doesn't stop you from catching measles, but it can make the course milder. And if you are already sick, it can still help. Sorry, forgot to include treatment in the last few, but there it is. Okay, so chickenpox. This is another live virus vaccine given at the same time as MMR, age 1 and 5. In fact, doctors can buy them together so they are in the same shot. I don't do this, though, because the combo shot has 10 times the amount of chickenpox as the separate vaccine. Much of the vaccine virus dies off when mixed and stored with the MMR viruses, so they have to put in a lot more when they first make it. Plus, the combo vaccine has a much higher rate of seizure reactions, 1 in 1,250 kids, compared to if you give the two shots in separate injections. But that's vaccine info. Sorry, we are focusing just on diseases right now. Chickenpox is a harmless disease for most kids. The chance of dying from it is about 1 in 65,000 cases. Back when everyone caught it, about 50 people died each year. Now about 5 Americans die from it each year. There is an antiviral treatment that may reduce the severity of the disease, although it's not recommended for healthy people. This disease is worse if you catch it after puberty, by the way, but it's still manageable and virtually never fatal. Now for our last childhood disease, hepatitis A. This barely deserves mention because it's a completely harmless type of food poisoning if young kids catch it. It occurs as small restaurant-based outbreaks. When older kids catch it, like elementary age and up, it's a little tougher with some vomiting and diarrhea, but not a big deal. If an adult catches Hep A, it can cause several days of vomiting, weeks of diarrhea, and some jaundice from liver inflammation. But no one dies of Hep A unless you already have severe liver disease. San Diego had an outbreak in the homeless population last year, many of whom had alcohol and drug abuse problems, so their livers were already shot. About 20 people died. But this does not happen in healthy people. We vaccinated at one year and 18 months, or two years, the timing of that booster is up to each office. The idea is to get some immunity so that kids are not caught up in a restaurant outbreak, but these rarely occur. And when they do, healthy people are not harmed. There is no treatment other than supporting the symptoms. Okay, take a deep breath. That was a lot of info. Yeah, it's second nature to me because I live these facts every day. But how do you, the parent, take all this in and make sense of it all? Oh, by the way, I didn't go over the last two diseases we vaccinate against, meningococcal disease and HPV, because those are teenage vaccines, and all of you here are making decisions for your babies, so I don't want to confuse you by throwing more facts in that you don't have to think about yet. Anyway, let's take a short break, and then we'll jump into the decision-making process. Okay, break's over. So let me summarize and break it down in a way that I think you, the parents of a young baby, should understand these diseases so you know why vaccines are recommended by the CDC, what the disease risk is, and what risks you are taking if you don't vaccinate for one or more of these. I'm going to assume that all of you are here because you don't just want to automatically get your child all of the 70 vaccine doses on the CDC schedule. You are here because you want to understand which vaccines your baby really needs. You don't want to get vaccines just because some scientist sitting on a committee somewhere decided that your baby needs them. You want to get vaccines only if your baby really does need them. The most straightforward way to describe a vaccine that your baby would need most is to consider the two criteria that make a vaccine most important. One, the disease has to be common enough that your baby is somewhat likely to catch it, 
And two, the disease would have to be severe if your baby did catch it. It would have to threaten your baby's life or likely cause permanent harm if your baby does survive. Now that's a disease worth vaccinating against, right? So what diseases fit both of these criteria? Actually, none. Not anymore, anyway. We are very fortunate that living in a modern society with good hygiene, healthy living conditions, proper sanitation, and advanced medicine, which, yes, includes vaccines, has brought us to a point where no dangerous disease is common and no common disease is dangerous. Let me say that again. Regarding these two disease criteria, all the dangerous diseases are extremely rare, and all the diseases that are still common are not likely to be dangerous or deadly. Now, I know what you are thinking. What about whooping cough? What about meningitis or measles, the flu, tetanus, hepatitis B? Each of these can be deadly, but what I'm saying is that the chance that your baby, your one individual baby, born this year among the 4 million other babies born in America, the chance that your baby is going to be harmed or die from one of these is statistically extremely small. It's tiny. It's way less than 1%. In fact, it's way less than 0.01%, 1 in 10,000. No one really knows exactly what that statistical risk is, but you can easily calculate it based on the fatality rate of diseases that kill babies every year. Here are a few examples. Whooping cough. 20 out of 4 million babies die every year of this. That's a 1 in 200,000 risk. And virtually all deaths are in infants 3 months or less, so the window of risk is short. Meningitis from Hib. One or two die every year, but let's just count all cases of Hib as serious because they are. That's 20 or so cases out of about 20 million kids, if we are just counting kids in the first five years of life, because that's the primary age range for this disease. So that's about one in a million risk. PC meningitis? We don't have very solid numbers, but experts estimate there are about 2,000 or so serious PC cases in the U.S. each year in children. If we use the same five-year age group, that's about a 1 in 10,000 risk, which is higher than the others. But this estimate really has its limitations because we really don't have solid data on how many severe PC cases occur nationwide each year. Measles? No children die from that in the U.S., but an adult did die a couple years ago. So that's a risk of one in our population of what? 350 million? The last child to die of measles in the U.S. was in 2003. Tetanus. One child case among about 20 million zero to five-year-olds. Including teens, it's about five cases in 72 million kids zero to 18 or a risk of about 1 in 14 million. The flu? We have roughly 100 fatalities in our group of kids 0 to 18 years, so that's a risk of 1 in 720,000. You can do the math on any disease, and you will see that the statistical danger to your one little baby is tiny. So if you choose to not vaccinate, what risk are you taking? The highest risk I see is that 1 in 10,000 risk of pneumococcal disease. All the other risks are lower. Please realize that I'm not saying you should not vaccinate. Many of my patients choose some vaccines. But what I want you to understand is that the disease danger is relatively small, and the decision to not vaccinate is not a dangerous one. It's all about understanding the disease risk comparing it to the vaccine risks, and deciding which risks you are more comfortable with as a parent. Now let me tell you what I've seen among my patients who don't vaccinate over these 30 years that I've been a pediatrician. In other words, if you don't vaccinate, what will your baby likely catch, and what will that be like? First, of course, is the flu. I'm not going to waste any time on that. 
Virtually all cases pass without harm, as I said before. But you can't come crying to me if your baby is pretty sick, wishing you gotten the flu shot that year. Be ready to go through a few flus during childhood. Plus, the flu shot doesn't work very well. Last year, it was only about 10% effective. Some years, it's as high as 60%. Next in commonality comes rotavirus. But we'll skip that because it's virtually always harmless. Next is whooping cough. It's pretty common, as I said. Now, as long as your baby does not catch it in the first few months of life, he or she will be fine. But your older baby or child might catch it because it's everywhere, and he might be stuck with a very tough cough for two or three months. It's no fun, and it is somewhat likely to happen. I see at least one case every month. If you identify it early and get on early antibiotics, the course may be relatively short. Plus, there's a very high dose of vitamin C protocol that you can find online that may work surprisingly well for whooping cough. Consider following that protocol if your child does catch it. Then there's PC disease, pneumococcal. I've had to put two kids in the hospital with PC pneumonia, a couple with bloodstream infections and one with meningitis. I've seen one Hib meningitis too. One parent said, I had no idea my child could catch pneumonia like this. I wish I'd vaccinated. Even though I do warn parents, many assume it won't happen to their child. It can, and it does. Your child might catch chickenpox, so you have to accept that he or she may go through that. The fatality rate for it is, again, only about 1 in 65,000 cases. I will also say that in my 30 years of pediatrics, not a single patient has ever been permanently harmed by any of these diseases, and I probably have the lowest vaccination rates of all peds in the state. No one has died and no one has suffered a severe complication. I've seen a few complications that were moderate, like some hearing loss from meningitis and some minor nerve complications from chickenpox, which was unfortunate. These parents may wish they had chosen the vaccine, but it's easy to say that after the fact. Am I just lucky, or are the diseases just so unlikely to be dangerous today? You ask an ICU doctor or an infectious disease specialist, they'll say something very different. They've seen the kids die because they're the ones who care for all the complicated, serious cases. But in the life of a regular private practice pediatrician, I just haven't seen it. Maybe that makes me less proactive about pushing vaccines, but I try to not be too casual about the diseases. I just present all the facts so you can make an educated decision. Now, I know there are other reasons to vaccinate against the disease besides just protecting your one child, such as doing it for the good of the public health. We'll discuss this in more detail later, but the reality is that very few vaccines prevent the spread of a disease. Many just protect an individual from feeling sick and reduce the severity of the disease for only that individual. But a vaccinated person will still catch the germ and spread it to others. This is especially true of whooping cough. So this public health argument is not valid for most shots. For the few shots that do help reduce the spread of a disease, you have to decide if you are willing to put your baby's health at risk from the vaccine side effects by doing vaccines you think your baby doesn't really need so that you can help protect others. Is that your responsibility? Or do you have the right to choose to not risk those side effects? Of course, you aren't risking anyone around you who is vaccinated unless their vaccine doesn't work. But that's the fault of the vaccine, not your fault. Even if you did vaccinate, your child's vaccine could fail and your child could catch and spread the disease. And if you spread the disease to someone who purposely did not vaccinate, that's a risk that they already freely accepted. So it's my opinion that you, as your baby's doctor, do have the right to opt out of a vaccine that you decide your baby doesn't need, or you decide the potential side effects are not worth the disease protection. This brings me to a side point. Do vaccines even work? I've talked a lot about why we vaccinate and how these vaccines can prevent disease. 
You may have read that some people claim vaccines don't even work. So why are we even talking about doing them? Well, I believe they do work. Some work better than others. Some don't work very well at all. The way I like to explain this is to understand how each vaccine works so you know what gains you can expect by getting it. Some totally prevent the disease, but some allow you to catch the disease and spread it to others, but just not feel as sick. It's the second group that people will point to and say, ha, the vaccine didn't work. Well, yes, it does, but it's not expected to prevent infection. It's just expected to prevent disease complications, so you are less likely to be harmed by the disease. So it will work in that way. It just won't work the way you thought it should. I will say, however, that there's a misconception in the media and the public, and among some doctors who are not educated about vaccines, that all vaccines completely prevent infection and prevent the spread. These people are wrong, and the harm that comes from this misconception is that they then blame people who don't vaccinate for spreading the disease. They don't realize that many of these vaccines don't prevent the spread. So which is which? And how do you factor these ideas into your decision? Don't worry, we'll come to that later. But in regard to your social responsibility for the few vaccines that do reduce disease spread, it's worth mentioning that one reason we do these shots is to protect the babies who are too young to be vaccinated yet. Measles and chickenpox are two such diseases because we don't give shots for those until age one. The media really shines a spotlight whenever that happens and casts blame on unvaccinated kids. That's why you have to be very responsible if you don't vaccinate against something that is very contagious. Don't sit in your doctor's waiting room with a fever and a rash or huge severe coughing fits for God's sake. Be smart. If your child is sick, don't go out. And that's true whether you are vaccinated or not. We all share that duty. But one thing I do find ironic in regard to the MMR and chickenpox vaccines and vulnerable babies less than one year old is this. Back when everyone caught measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox when they were kids, and the diseases were mostly harmless, they developed lifetime immunity. So all moms were immune and their babies were born immune and were therefore not vulnerable during the first year of life when the diseases can be more serious. Now that we vaccinate, the moms growing up in this generation don't catch the diseases. They have no natural immunity. Their childhood vaccines wear off and they don't pass much immunity to their babies. It's really our public health policy of vaccination that has created these vulnerable infants. So when such a baby does get sick, who do we blame? Or do we simply blame no one and say that sickness and disease are nobody's fault and they're just a part of life? This ties into the concept of herd immunity, which I was going to cover later, but hey, let's jump into it right now. Some people think that herd immunity is a myth or a lie. I disagree. I look at it not in terms of whether or not we have herd immunity, but as what type of herd immunity we have opted for as a society. Herd immunity is the concept that if virtually all people in a herd are immune to something, then the few who aren't immune will still be protected. The disease can't enter the herd and take hold because most are immune. Maybe a few get sick, but overall the herd survives. That's herd immunity. We used to have what could be termed natural herd immunity, but it was very different than what we expect out of herd immunity from vaccines today. Prior to vaccines, everyone caught the diseases when they were the most routine during childhood. Measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox used to be rites of passage. Everyone caught them at the age when complications and death were least expected. Everyone grew up immune, including moms. This immunity was passed to each baby to protect them for the first year or so, as I've already said. Parents' immunities were reboosted when their kids caught the diseases, and pregnant women were immune to chickenpox and rubella during their pregnancies. Adults didn't get sick, which was important because that's when disease complications can occur. 
And that's one of the keys to how this natural herd immunity worked. People caught the diseases when they were designed to be caught, when they were handled best by the herd. Chickenpox is one example of a disease that's mild for most people during childhood, but more severe for adults. Measles too, as is mumps and rubella. Hepatitis A is another good example. In third world countries, every child catches it when it's harmless and goes mostly unnoticed. But it's a bear of a disease when you are older, especially if you have liver problems already. So parents in those countries want their kids to catch it young. Side note, sorry, that doesn't really apply to us here because we barely have hep A. Anyway, moving on. Whooping cough is another example. When kids catch it naturally, it's certainly no fun, but it is ultimately harmless in virtually all cases. And then they become immune for life. They won't catch it and spread it around again and again. Yes, if newborns catch it, it can be very serious, as I've already said. But new research at the NIH and FDA has shown that when kids who are vaccinated catch whooping cough, they don't develop long-term immunity. So they will catch the disease again later. Yes, these vaccinated individuals will feel less sick, but they'll also spread the disease more. So there's a trade-off when a society opts for artificial herd immunity from vaccination. But there's a cost to this natural herd immunity. Some fatalities and some complications from disease occur. Back when everyone caught measles, about 400 kids died every year. Some babies were born with rubella-induced birth defects if the rare mom was not immune and she caught rubella during pregnancy. About 50 people died of chickenpox each year. 20 young infants still die of whooping cough every year. That's a tough cost for a society to bear, especially when presented with a solution like vaccines. So we opted to shift over to artificial herd immunity. The vulnerability to diseases was turned upside down, or inside out, if you will. Here's what I mean. We started vaccinating all the kids so eventually they all stopped catching the diseases during childhood. We stopped losing the 400 kids to measles every year or the 50 to chickenpox. No more rubella birth defects or very rarely so. By the way, I know that 400 deaths from measles in a modern country like ours sounds terrible, and it is, but this death rate would have been much lower if we'd known back then how to treat measles and how to reduce complications with high-dose vitamin A. So nowadays, if measles came back, I don't think we'd have such a fatality rate. Anyway, now kids don't catch the diseases, and they grow up without natural immunity. Their vaccines wear off, so they spend the rest of their adult life susceptible. The moms start having babies, but don't pass immunity onto their babies. Consequently, babies spend the first year vulnerable. That's why people who are against mandatory vaccines will say vaccine-induced herd immunity is a myth. Most of the herd is technically not immune. Think back to natural immunity for a moment. Babies and adults were safe and kids got sick. With artificial immunity, kids don't get sick and babies and adults are vulnerable. Interesting, huh? Well, I think so at least. Why do people look at this artificial herd immunity as a good thing if it leaves so many vulnerable? Well, it's because these four diseases are no longer around among children, so the vulnerable are rarely exposed. But here's the catch. When the vulnerable are exposed, they are put in more danger than they would have been under the natural immunity model. For example, a baby who has no immunity catches measles and could get very sick. A pregnant mom catches rubella and her baby gets birth defects. A 50-year-old man catches chickenpox and dies, or a college kid catches mumps and becomes sterile. None of these things happened, or happened so rarely under the natural immunity model, because virtually all kids caught the diseases at the ages when these things didn't happen. The baby, the pregnant mom, the 50-year-old man, and the college kid would all have been immune. So which is a better model? I'm not going to answer that. 
I think as a society, we've opted for the artificial model. And it would work just fine if it wasn't for one thing, vaccine side effects. The rare but serious or even fatal vaccine side effects make some people opt out of the artificial model. And that leaves holes in the artificial herd immunity, holes that the vaccinated blame the unvaccinated for. But the unvaccinated aren't the only holes in our immunity. There's vaccine failure too. So vaccinated and unvaccinated alike could be guilty of starting an outbreak. In the natural herd, there really weren't outbreaks. Everyone just accepted the disease. But in the artificial herd, outbreaks stand out like a sore thumb. So that's how people who don't vaccinate claim that herd immunity is a myth. It's because vaccines aren't effective enough to completely protect the herd, especially because they only protect the children of the herd, leaving the babies and adults vulnerable. Plus, unvaccinated people factor in the cost of vaccination into the equation. Not the financial cost, but the cost of severe side effects and any long-term problems that vaccines may be responsible for. It's that cost which may affect everyone who vaccinates, the many, compared to the cost of the comparatively few who die from a disease they didn't vaccinate against, that makes supporters of the natural herd immunity model criticize artificial immunity. So there it is, my take on herd immunity without telling you what the right answer is. But this raises two questions. Are diseases on the rise because we don't have enough herd immunity? And what about the immunocompromised kids in the herd? First, the disease rise or lack thereof. The media really hit this fear button hard when they talk about vaccines. They portray measles, mumps, meningitis, pertussis, or even polio as diseases that are all on the rise. The fact is, none of these are arising at all, except for perhaps pertussis. Measles occurs in small isolated outbreaks with no continuous rise. Mumps has always been around here and there with no rise. Meningococcal meningitis is very rare with no increase. And yes, polio is not coming back, despite the media's best efforts to convince people it is. Pertussis is the only one but it's not because of a lack of vaccination. More on that later, though, because that's a complicated discussion. But the media have to blame someone or something for any disease outbreak, and they have to keep the impression that these diseases are a threat in order to encourage people to continue their vaccines for the good of the herd. But the reality is that we are in the same place with diseases as we've always been since we reduced or eliminated them in the 80s and 90s. And at this point, the fact that some families opt out of vaccines isn't changing that at all. We also hear a lot about protecting the immunocompromised kids. That's another aspect of herd immunity. They say we need everyone in the herd to cooperate with vaccination in order to protect the immunocompromised. If your unvaccinated child spread a disease to a child who is immunocompromised, that can be very serious. But this can also happen when a vaccine fails and a vaccinated person spreads a disease. Even the live virus vaccine germs themselves can make immunocompromised kids very sick. But no one blames people who comply with vaccination, and they never blame a vaccine when it fails. They only blame the unvaccinated. Here's how I consider this issue. First, kids who are severely immunocompromised aren't even in school or out in public much because they could die of any disease, not just the few that are vaccine preventable and still common. So there's little chance your child would infect someone who is immunocompromised. Plus, they are way more likely to catch something dangerous that we don't vaccinate against. Also, immunocompromised kids have had virtually all of their vaccines already anyway. So they are protected because previously given vaccines still work, even if you become mild to moderately immunocompromised later. Under the natural herd immunity model, these kids would have caught the childhood diseases when younger and would then be immune during their immunocompromised days. So one could blame the artificial herd immunity model for any vulnerability they have now. The immunocompromised are indeed an issue, 
but I don't like to see them used as pawns in a game to mandate vaccines. Then there's the opposite side of that equation, the vaccine-compromised kids who have suffered severe reactions and are permanently disabled. Don't they deserve some consideration as well? Don't they have rights? And doesn't it matter that if you vaccinate, your child could become one of the vaccine-compromised? Don't you have the right in a society to not choose that risk? Are these kids less important than the immunocompromised? We see a child with leukemia at school and our heart goes out to them. We see a mentally and physically disabled kid in a wheelchair from a severe vaccine injury and we ignore them. They don't deserve that. I feel like we as a society should work together to keep all kids safe and healthy while also accepting our differences. We don't have to discriminate against a certain group who thinks differently. We don't have to consider one group as having more rights than another. We should all get along better because of our differences, not in spite of them. Ethically speaking, what's interesting is that the natural herd immunity group was here first. So should they be forced to participate in the artificial immunity project or should they be able to opt out? Again, all those with artificial immunity are protected from harm as long as their vaccines work, but they wear off or sometimes don't work as expected, and then the blame game starts. Why can't we all just get along? Ha <laughs> ha, but seriously too, why does this have to be a fight? Anyway, there are so many ways to look at this, and you as the parent have to consider them all. And that brings us to vaccine risk. What exactly is the risk of if you choose vaccines? What are the risks of each individual vaccines? What are the risks of the program as a whole? Do we know everything about all these risks? Have we studied vaccines well enough to completely understand it all? What do we not know yet? And what about all those strange vaccine ingredients? I can see many of you are starting to panic because your brains are now pretty full. Let's take another five minute break to stretch. There are snacks in the back and coffee. I need some coffee too. Then we'll jump into vaccine risk. Paulina and Ruben Gonzalez were silent for the first few minutes of the ride home, each trying to process what they had just learned. Finally, Ruben asked, do you think he portrayed Hib accurately? Yes, I do. I think in hindsight, if we could have vaccinated for it early, I would have. And for our next baby, I'm pretty sure I'd want to do it. Or we could delay it and just rely on the one dose at 15 months, offered Reuben. What happened to Pablo was an anomaly. Statistically speaking, it would be virtually unheard of for our second baby to catch Hib. But that's years away. Who knows when the next child will come along? Yeah, chuckled Paulina, patting her belly. You aren't going to be putting a new baby in here for a long time. So, wow, what about the whole section on vaccine risks and side effects? That was very interesting. I mean, we kind of already knew a lot of that, but I had no idea about some of the risks Dr. Tommaso presented. And I like how he pretty much only presented the solid risks that the CDC acknowledges the real risks that are backed by science, like seizures, encephalitis, and other severe neurological injuries. And the arthritis for teen and adult women from the MMR vaccine, added Paulina. One in four have an arthritis reaction, and an unknown percentage of those go on to suffer lifelong rheumatoid arthritis. Not so much when babies or young kids get the shot, but for women. That's a high risk. Remember when our OB told us I was not immune to rubella anymore in my blood work and I should get an MMR shot after Pablo was born? You know, because they don't make plain rubella shots anymore. She never mentioned I could get rheumatoid arthritis. And my mom and grandma both have RA. It runs in families. Imagine if we hadn't known better and I'd gotten that shot. Remember how that nurse looked at me in the hospital? You know... That young pretty one who kept trying to give Pablo the hep B shot? Yeah, I don't remember her, Reuben tried to shrug, earning an eye roll from his wife. And I remember you trying so hard to pretend you didn't notice her, 
Ha! You think I didn't notice? We girls see all, my husband. But the best part of tonight for me was what Dr. Tommaso said about the overall statistical risk of vaccines compared to the risks of suffering a dangerous case of a disease, all based on CDC data. Like the risk of brain swelling and inflammation from the DTaP vaccine is one in a thousand, but the risk of dying from pertussis as an infant is only one in 200,000. Plus, tetanus risk while young is only what? One case in 20 million young kids? And diphtheria risk is zero. So why would any parent ever risk the DTaP vaccine with their young baby? Plus, that's a shot that doesn't prevent the spread of the disease to others, so you can't make a public health argument. And for every single other vaccine, all of the 15 others, the risk of suffering harm from a vaccine reaction seems greater than the risk that you'll be harmed by that disease. By far. Dr. Tommaso didn't really emphasize that point, though. I got the feeling that he expected his audience to kind of figure that out for themselves. If more people knew that, they'd be more careful with vaccines. And that's why the government, the media, pharma, and the mainstream medical community are working so hard to make sure people don't find that out, finished Paulina. See, you have learned so much in these past few months. I know you accepted my beliefs on this early on, and you weren't quite so sure about not vaccinating at first, but see, I was right, and you know it. Yeah, Reuben grinned. You'd read so much about it, and I barely knew anything. And I was man enough to admit that and trust your instincts. I think a lot of men just blow their wives off and blindly accept that doctors must know what they are doing with vaccines. And they are too busy to do any reading themselves and too proud to admit ignorance. But not my husband, Paulina smiled back, grabbing his hand. Not my husband. Peter was tired. He liked giving these talks, but they were tiring. Even after he'd put all this into a book form and even shot a video version, parents still wanted to hear it live, to talk it through person to person, the human connection. But he also knew he couldn't keep giving these talks every month for the rest of his life. There has to be a better way to present this information live to these patients, a way that doesn't just involve me something that could be presented to parents all over the country. No, all over the world. Peter would put a lot of thought into this idea in the months to come. Oh, wait, darn it. I totally skipped talking about vaccine ingredients tonight. He made a mental note to email the attendees his one-pager on that. And as tired as he was tonight, he was kind of glad he'd forgotten. Ingredients are the most boring part of the talk. I have to figure out a way to spice that part up.